we're, we're live. Um, welcome uh, to everyone. We're excited to have all of you guys here. I think we've uh, got a little bit over 50 uh, business owners and professionals uh, joining us for today's session, which is really, really exciting to see. Um, we're going to be talking, uh, you know, through one of the topics that has really been a big question in the last while, you know, growth and profitability uh, in the current circumstances that, we've, that we face as, as business people in South Africa and, or, and around the world. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the must-dos as a company and as a business owner and as a finance team. Like, what are those things that have to be done in every business to make sure that the company can scale up, that it can keep growing and moving forward, and, and that it can ultimately generate good profit and good cash flow? Uh, so th those are some of the questions that I'm going to be posing uh, to some of our top chartered accountants within the Outsource CFO team. We're going to talk about a couple of things like, you know, profitability and growth in the context of the current times, like, you know, is it possible uh, to, to drive those two, uh, two levers? Then we're gonna look at a tool called the power of one, also known as the seven levers, which basically gives you the seven levers you can pull to increase profitability and to increase cash flow. We're gonna chat about that. We're gonna look at the, the meeting rhythms that every finance team and every company should have. We're gonna talk about some of the compliance and governance pitfalls uh, that businesses face that, that eat into the bottom line because of some of the mistakes that are, are often get made. We're going to talk about some profit benchmarks you as a, as a business owner to think about how is my company currently doing against you know global growth um, benchmarks against global profitability benchmarks and how can we keep improving um, and then we're going to ask some questions you know around what are the things to ask your finance team if you're a business owner you don't necessarily have a finance background the, the main thing you need to be able to do is to connect with your finance team at a level of like you know what are the questions that you need to ask to them to get the right information from them so that you can drive your business with that. So we're gonna unpack a few, a few of those. With, with that being said, um, I'd like to introduce our, our, our panel to, uh, to you guys. Uh, Donna Pretorius is one of our co-founders at Outsource CFO. He's gonna be joining us uh, on, on session here. Uh, Lasagna Bad is one of our senior most uh, CFO consultants at Outsource CFO. Anyways, Asma is our head of advisory on the CFO side. I'm lucky to have uh, all of their expertise here on the panel with me today. So we're, we're excited to have you guys. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Brilliant, guys. So I hope, you, I hope your seatbelts uh, are on for all the participants and that you guys are, are ready for what we're about to, to un unpack here. Um, we're, to, we're just for, if, if anyone's joined a little bit late, we're talking, you know, the must-dos uh, to build a scalable, profitable company. What are those kind of key things that every, every business should be doing that the business owner must think about and kind of transfer to their finance team? And that the finance team can then yield to the business owner to make sure that uh, they're driving growth and they're driving profitability and they're meeting best uh, best practice. So maybe as a first opening question uh, to the panel, guys, I just want to ask, you know, is it even possible to drive growth and profitability in market circumstances like we faced with COVID in the last four or five months? Azan, maybe I'll start with you. No, oh, definitely. Um, I think it definitely depends on the industry that you are in. Um, but I definitely think it's possible. Um, I've seen some companies that have seen great revenue growth during this time, specifically where they are placed and the services that they offer. Um, and also others that are actually making more profits now than what they've made previously. Um, sure. That's mainly due to them being really um, very um, urgent, if I could use that word, with the way that they cut their cost. Um, yeah. They did significant cost cutting very early on a few months ago. Um, and that obviously has an impact, which may not be quite sustainable, but it's definitely possible. Great. I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, Uwais? Uh, some people might say it, it can be quite difficult, but if you can show that you're adding value and you can provide additional value than you were before, and if you're showing better value than your competitors, then you did it easier time to make profits. Great. Don, do you have anything to ask? You just open the floor. You no. are to add to that, sorry. I'm, I'm definitely an optimist, um, but I think uh, um, not to um, overpromise and under deliver to your stakeholders during this time. So it might be necessary for you just to realign expectations uh, for this year. But from a growth and a profit point of view, I can just add to what Luzon and Ways has mentioned. You know, some industries that's an essential um, goods or services, and they might see an actual increase or 
And I've even talked to some of my private equity network partners to see how some of their investors are flourishing uh, that perhaps might be in the e-commerce space. So definitely some growth and, and profit during this time. But for, you know, ordinary businesses, um, you, know, um, you know, growth might still be achieve achievable. Um, it's just might come with some aggressive cost cutting during this time. Thanks, guys. I think yeah, I think that kind of sets the scene for what we're what we're about to, to talk through. Donna, while we're on you, I just want to ask the question: like, you know, what does a scalable, profitable company look like? Like, how would you describe that? Well, if I were to look at the characteristics of a scalable, profitable company, I would say definitely an agile team with the right mindset for scaling. Yeah, I think uh, it all starts with a mindset. Hmm. Um, I would also uh, think of a, a strong balance sheet, especially during this time. You know, you might get uh, companies that just uh, are making losses and uh, would have just um, focused on sales um, and would have just chased uh, getting um, external funding. I think uh, investors' appetite is a lot more different now. You know, you're going to have to be your own funder. Happy paying clients will have to be your funder during this time. Um, you know, so definitely a strong balance sheet focusing on cash. You need to have uh, aim at to have three months worth of cash in the bank. Um, and then the big thing is focusing on the right problem. I think that that that's a, a big um, characteristic of a scalable business. Your problem needs to be big enough. Uh, it needs to be, you, in your, you need to be able to solve that. It might be that your market might be too small. It need to be a bigger market. It might be that the consumer spending habits have changed um, on, you're not solving that problem. So you just make sure that you've, you've got that right, uh, uh, um, you know, problem that you're solving. Then low, a scalable, profitable company for me, personally is like a company that already has started um, funding and investing in their future and has have looked at already seeing how they can get a uh, competitor edge on their competitors by investing in their technology and, and improving their efficiencies and all, all wins, improving their margins and, and, and all of that. And this might be during this time, it might be a little bit of a kick for the guys um, as a motive, extra motivation to, 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 to you know think like that so you know there's all, always opportunity to scale um you know and new markets opening from a scale and profitability point of view um yeah um large remarks of scaling profitable business is a, is a company that can possibly look at technology innovation resulting in 10x returns but obviously that's not always possible but really a company with the right mindset that's agile during this time open to experiment during this time and really focusing on funding the future because the rules of the game have really changed. Thanks for that, Donna. Always, I see some smiles coming through there. So if you'd yes. like to add to this concept of what does a scalable, profitable company really look like in this time? So for, for me, a, a scalable, profitable company needs to have a plan to achieve that scale or achieve that profit. Mm -hmm. uh, the old adage, if you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. A simple plan like having a budget and a cash flow in place and maybe having two or three different scenarios in that budget so that if the economic climate changes or if you're not achieving the expected goals uh, that you can still pivot and adjust and still reach a certain target. So uh, for me, having a plan is probably the most important thing of a scal scalable and profitable company. Love it. No, thanks, thanks for that. Um, so a lot of things I've heard from you guys um, has been around changing up strategy as well in this time. Donna, it, it, you know, Strategy is one of the things that you eat for eat for breakfast. Uh, is there a change in strategy required for the average company right now in, in terms of refocusing to get them onto the right uh, path or, uh, to be in line with what you're talking about here today? Yeah, uh, low, I like what Uwe's mentioned with, with the plan. And I think the strategy needs to be getting that one page plan into place. You know, what's your people plan, what's your finance plan, your marketing or your product plan, everything on one one page and in in order to you know past performance is not an indication of future performance especially now, during this time ever. all the assumptions that you're used to that might be questionable now so you really need to go back to the roots and doing a, a SWOT analysis uh, really looking at what your your strengths are what's the fundamental what's essential to your business what's the bread and butter really looking at your weaknesses you know um, it might be your supply chain um, might be affected during to do during the lock, lockdown. You really need to really look at your supplies, quality, and then timelines as well. Opportunities. It might be that there might be new opportunities presenting domestically, even globally. Um, you know, um, 
from a, a trains point of a point of view, you know, there's so, so such big changes in trains. Your consumer habits and spinning habits might have changed completely. So you need to get more data on that and experiment more more with that, and and really talk with your with your niche client and hear what what their needs are. And then lastly, there might be some threats. You know, if you're regulatory, some of the guys in the liquor industry are feeling it um, unfortunately. Uh, a lot you know so you really need to uh, from a strategy point of view you really need to um, reassess your um, position i think the first four six months of the lockdown everyone just on a survival mode and just um, you know but now we're getting a little bit more uh, clarity on what pieces we need to start picking up uh, you know and start formulating that re revised strategy so that you can adjust your budgets and your plans towards that and really carve out that one one page action step plan for your business to focus um, on um, going forward. Love it. Lizanne, Donna mentioned some of the industries that are really taking strain now. Right in the beginning, you mentioned some of the ones that are doing really good in terms of generating profit and generating some growth. What, what industries are those typically at the moment? Um, so one of them specifically um, is a firm that was already um, doing everything online. They already had a virtual office um, and everybody were working from home. Um, so they were perfectly set up for that. Um, another one is in marketing and in social media uh, marketing. Um, so I think because everything's moving more online, um, people probably realize, as Diana mentioned, that spending habits changes. Um, so, you know, a lot of people spend more time online, so they, they buy more online, um, they start living their lives more online, and um, people just want to um, market more online. So it was those two specifically that I was thinking about. Nice. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so one of the big tools that I want us to stand still on a little bit today is, is called the, the power of one and the seven levers. So it basically comes down to this concept of 1% is of, of changes, kind of small incremental changes in, in cash flow and profitability that have a massive effect on the, on the bottom line and the money in the bank at the end of the day. The, the, the principle speaks about kind of seven levers that you as a, as a business can start pulling in order to make sure that you, you engineer further profit and you engineer further improvements in cash flow. And we love this tool at, at Outsource CFO. So the, the first couple of levers, the first four, basically address um, profitability. So that we're, we're talking there about an increase in price, which is a complicated one. We'll talk about that first. An increase in volume, basically selling more. And those two first ones then basically uh, affect your, your top line revenue, right? So you can increase your top line revenue. The next one, you can, the, the third one is then that you can decrease your direct costs. So your cost of sales, how can you bring that cost of sales down to make sure that your gross profit margin is higher at the end of the day? And the fourth lever in terms of profitability is your operating expenses, right? All of the expenses that you can basically cut down on uh, to make sure that there's more profit at the end of the day. So increase revenue, decrease cost of sales and decrease uh, over, overheads is basically uh, the, the, the kind of the principles of, of, of improving profitability at a very kind of basic high level sense. And then there are three more levers that speak to, um, to uh, your, your cash in the bank. So that is how fast can you recover your debtors, right? How fast can you turn an invoice that goes out into money in the bank? The faster you can do that, the more money you have in your bank. How quickly can you turn your inventory around? Um, so, so basically, uh, you know, how fast can you from purchase to sell, move, the, move inventory across if you're a products business? Uh, and then the, the, the last one um, then basically speaks about uh, your creditors days. Like, can you slow down the process of money flowing out of the company by negotiating with, uh, with your suppliers? So these are basically the seven levers that we're gonna stand still on. Uh, and those are the seven levers that each of us as business owners have in our hands that we can start pulling on and tweaking and figuring out, are we gonna cut costs? Are we gonna cut direct costs? Are we gonna improve, increase revenue? Are we gonna move our data cycle uh, faster? How can we, Make sure that more profit and more money, more cash stay in the company at the end of the day. Uh, if those positions are negative, how can we get it to break even? And if they're positive, how can we get it to more positive, right? How can we move the company uh, forward? So maybe let's get to the, 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 the first kind of uh, profit lever. So those are um, on the side of revenue generation. So, so the first tool that you have to increase your revenue is basically just to increase the price of your product or service to your existing customers, right? But that's a complex thing in this market where everyone's trying to cut costs how do you bring in a, a, a price increase? So Uwais, I know you're, you're ready for this, uh, for this difficult one. Is it even possible to talk to customers about price increases right now across the board? 
it, it can be a difficult conversation, but if you can show that you're adding more value for a slightly for slightly more cost, a lot if the customer sees that the customer is getting a lot more value, they might be willing to uh, to pay that increase in costs. Especially if if you're the only one offering it in your field, if if you are much better than your competitors, there's no reason why you couldn't in, increase your costs slightly to uh, but provide a lot more value. And it might mean that. Uh, not a lot, maybe perhaps not as much time that you're spending, but from the customer's point of view, they can definitely see that they're getting more value. Uh, I think that would probably be the, the, the best thing that I would recommend. Also, realizing what sets you apart from your competitors or something that, that might make you increase your cost. I love it. So, kind of a unique selling proposition to yes. make sure that your business stands up um, and just, you know, the perceived value from clients. Like, how can you up the perceived value uh, to be able to justify um, higher costs? Definitely, yeah, exactly. I, I like those. Uh, so the, the other thing that you can use to move your revenue up is to sell more, right? To increase the volume of products or services that, that, that you, that you uh, sell at the, end of, at the end of the day. So how does one go about, uh, you know, increasing revenue in totality? How can one, um, how can one uh, sell more? Who have I got on this? Uh, Donna. Yeah, oh, no, uh, very interesting one. And I think very applicable to all of us. Um, so if you're in a product or, or services industry, if you're in a product industry with looking at the quantities of uh, produce sold, and if we're in a services industry, it might be amount of billable hours or value um, added to clients. Um, I, th I think from a, from a sales point of view, um, to, to, to almost implement a sales culture at your firm, uh, typically you would have had a, uh, you might have a sales department and sales reps, but to really uh, um, like adopt a sales culture, uh, it's not only the sales guys that needs to do sales during this time. Um, culture trumps strategy. So if you can build a culture of of people um, rating um, employees, understanding your products and services, and, and that they are also keen to to um, to uh, advocate your product or service you know i think that could also ramp up sales then just from a from a, a purely let's say from a bottle bottleneck point of view let's say you're in the consulting industry or so there might be some inefficiencies in your team that prohibits them from having more excess time available for consulting or so or going on on, on focusing on business development so a good way of, you know in the consulting industries is almost relying on templates and tools and standard operating procedures to to fast forward the, the value add and making sure that the client um, ha, um, experience more value with um, lesser amount of time a focus on on the mundane um, and non-value add uh, area so just bringing that automation um, then then lastly you know if you are wanting to boost volume and you know i'm not, not a sales specialist but really just focusing on uh, um, your sales function um, you know uh, making sure that uh, leads don't fall through the crack you know the the basics you know and uh, uh, you know repeat business and maintaining existing clients with superb customer experience, you know, because it's, it's quite expensive to chase new clients. The client acquisition of new clients is very expensive. So just to maintain your existing quantities, you know, that during this time might be your main focus, you know? Um, and so, yeah. Um, Absolutely. A good, yeah. So that's just a one way of a few thoughts on, on the matter. Yeah. Yeah, preserve existing revenue and find a couple of avenues to make sure that you can either prove more value to ask a higher price for it or figure out ways in which to be able to sell more through best, best practice principles. I like it. Shall we get into the cost cutting side of things, guys? So the, the, the next lever after increasing, if we can't increase revenue more or if we've already increased revenue, then we need to see how can we bring direct costs down while still delivering. Um, Lazan, can I, can I ask you for a couple of ideas in terms of how does one cut direct costs of delivering a product or service? Yeah, I think what's important here, Lo, is to really go back to basics and look at the smallest component of the product that you deliver um, or that makes up that product or the service that you deliver um, and to identify um, the different savings that you can make. One of the things one can do is maybe to review your product features and see um, is it possible to actually leave that feature out? Does it really add a specific value or a value that, the, that your customer wants? Both Donna and UAs mentioned um, value add. Um, I read this great book um, recently called Ask by Ryan Levesque. Um, 
And he said, we're so afraid to go to our clients and simply ask what they want, but it's the easiest thing to do. We can do surveys you know, in whatever way. So simply ask your clients what they want. Maybe there's a specific feature in your product um, that's not that important to them. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is that if your client asks for something specific, now may not necessarily be the time to spend a lot of money on research and development um, and not try to bend backwards for your clients. Um, something else that you can do is to see um, what's right for your business versus um, do you need to buy in bulk and save um, money that way and get a discount on your products or do you need to implement something like just in time where you really just get products in um, or your raw materials in as you as you produce. Um, I think on the labor side, unfortunately, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, to cut your your staff numbers. Um, I know very early on in the lockdown period, um, one of my clients mentioned to me, it feels like she's overreacting um, because she was very aggressive with her staff numbers that she cut. Now she's looking back and it wasn't an easy process, but she's very happy that she did that. Um, something else to do is to have a look at automation. Um, that may, of course, require some capex in the beginning, but um, oh. capex layout, but it can save time or money over, over time. Um, consider putting some of your staff on short time. Um, I think if somebody has a choice, they'll rather get 80 or 60% of the, their salary than no salary. Um, it's maybe also a good time to review staff's KPIs um, and just to review the, the process that you use to manage your workforce. Sure. There's a lot of golden nuggets in there. Thank you, Lazar. I think that's, uh, that's really nice and, and, and comprehensive and a lot of things to think about. So yeah, we want to be able to, you know, rent, still render the quality product or service that we, that we are you know, known for in the market as, as a business. But you want to see how can you, you know, make the, the actual cost uh, per unit, uh, you know, kind of way more in your favor. And interesting, okay. I'm going to, a quote of a, of a quote, uh, Donnie Nell, who's one of the global coaches for entrepreneur organization recently said, uh, he's friends with, with one of the Nando's uh, co-founders. And they said like they were measuring their profitability in terms of the, you know, the region or the specific area or even the city. And they weren't quite getting the numbers right until they drilled it down to their profit per chicken. Um, you know, what is that smallest yeah. kind of economic unit that you can measure the revenue, direct costs, and operating expenses of. And once they got that right and understood their profit per chicken, they could manage the whole group in terms of that and, and the business started really turning, uh, turning around and, make, uh, and doing really well. So I think uh, for you as a business owner, figure out you know, what is your chicken? Like, how can you figure out what's the smallest unit that you get that is income generating and expense causing? And how can you maximize the value that the business retains while still rendering a quality product or service to, to, to your customer? I think that's, that's kind of the, the, the golden question, right? So it brings us into the last lever we have to increase profitability. And we've touched on that somewhat uh, in the conversation so far, but it's cutting costs, right? Like in, uh, just reducing your overhead structure, like those, those non-direct fixed costs in the business. Um, how can we go about that? Donna, would you, would you feel this one for us? What are the, some of the principles you've seen applied to cost cutting in the last while in terms of overheads? No, I think the first one is a, a realization about uh, what is your actual expenditure, you know, and it might be that for every line item under your income statement, under operating expenditure, someone from top management needs to take ownership of that and they need to be able to give feedback on that and understand, understand the underlying triggers that in, um, incurs those expenditures and the, the contracts that's bounded by that. So I think that's, a, that's an important principle. A second important principle with, uh, with regarding to cost cutting operationally is the 2080 principle, the parity principle. It, it's, it's almost like 20% of your line items make out 80% of the overheads, um, you know, and uh, it might be those ones that you really need to, to focus on to have the, the biggest uh, effect. Um, some people mentioned, you know, if you're going to cut, you need to cut deep in the beginning. So, you know, it, it, and, uh, we've seen that with a lot of clients with cost cutting. Um, but the thing about overheads and those of you that are a little bit renowned with, with cost management, you know, and have some exposure in that, what, what you want to achieve with overheads as well is, is to really understand what triggers the overheads and see to what extent can you make overheads a, a variable cost or indirect cost as well. So where you have flexibility in changing the way how staff works from overhead and, and putting some um, commission targets in place, making that um, overheads very 
variables that could work, or it might be that you are reliant on on, on, on some sort of uh, independent contractors with flexible time coming in or renegotiating re costs with, with, uh, with your suppliers or, you know, asking for discounts and, you know, and all of that, um, all of that could be ways of how you can really look at overheads. But in the short, um, like Luzon has said previously as well, you really need to ask yourself what is essential for your business to, to, to survive now, uh, right now. And what's nice to have where you, you can live without and just really making those calls and it might be changing, um, stopping staff credit cards for staff welfare or those kind of stuff. But really, and every line item needs to invest, be investigated during this time and, you, and someone needs to take responsibility for each line item. Yeah, that's such a good principle, Don. I remember sitting with a, with a client when the crisis hit and their revenue was going to be severely uh, impacted. And we went through every single line item on the income side and we said, like, can we cut this completely? Can we cut it partially? Uh, or do we absolutely, absolutely need it? And if we cut, we're cutting it partially, who's going to drive that conversation? And if we're cutting it completely, who's going to give notice to the supplier? And kind of like just going through the whole income statement like that. I think if, you're, if your business is in crisis at the moment, it's definitely something to apply. And even if the company is doing well, it's quite a good exercise every now and then to just see like, you know, which of the things you're incurring expenses on actually really add value. Uh, that, that same entrepreneur said, we, we, re we realized we actually had two CRM systems that we're paying for. We were using bits of the one and bits of the other one, which we is paying for both. And we were, it didn't really matter. But now that it's, you know, the belt's a bit tighter, now you can't afford to make those kinds of mistakes. You really need to be pedantic about the, the, the detail on this. Guys, I think that that's a lot of really good golden nuggets from so many companies that, have, that, have, uh, that we've collectively, collectively work, worked on over the years uh, in terms of you know, driving a top line up and driving expenses down and figuring out how to maximize the bottom line profit. But then we also need to make sure that we turn profit into cash. So I want to get into the last three levers that are specifically around cash. And the first one is on, on debtors days. How can we recover our debtors faster? The shorter your data cycle, the more money is in the bank for the company faster and the less cash you need to run your operation. Uh, Uwais, what are your best tips in terms of turning your data around quickly? Oh, if, if, your, if your company is really in a cash pinch, consider offering early settlement terms, uh, maybe 5% reduction in price if you get paid in five days as opposed to the normal 30 days or, or invoice discounting. But that's really if you're really in a cash crunch. If we're talking to the businesses that are scaling and profitable, uh, I think it's very important to agree payment terms in some sort of service level agreement. Mm -hmm. It surprises me well, so many uh, uh, businesses that come along where they don't have any agreements with their, uh, with their uh, customers and I, I can't understand why. Obviously the, the best debtors day cycle is upfront payment, either f fully upfront or 50% upfront and 50% on completion. Um, better, the best debtors days is no debtors, but also if there was a way to automate the process, uh, for example, through debit orders, uh, customers sometimes forget or they've got other things on their mind, the less friction, the better in terms of bringing that sort of money in. Uh, and uh, tools like, like Zero also allow for automated invoice reminders and automated statements that go out days before payment is due, just to remind the customer to pay instead of having someone having to physically go and call them to, uh, to, to, to pay the outstanding amounts. I think that's what I definitely recommend. Perfect. No, I mean, there, there's a, yeah, I, I think yeah, just starting with basics, right? Just getting, getting your invoices out on time, making sure all the invoices go out, making sure there's automated follow-ups uh, with, with the guys, just starting with, with basics and then, uh, you know, they, then, then turning, uh, turning up the, the heat in terms of getting those data in as, as fast as you can. Thanks, Wes. I really like that. So for, for inventory companies, there's another layer of complexity here in the six uh, lever year, which is basically to reduce inventory days. What we mean by that is kind of that's the, the you know, your inventory days measures how, how, how many days is the average unit of inventory sit at the company on its books before it gets sold, because that's the time you need to carry the cash that you've spent on that, on that, uh, on that unit, right? So we want to kind of like, as soon as our inventory comes in, we want to get it out the door, preferably. And we would like to actually pay for it uh, only after we've sold it. Uh, that's the uh, kind of ideal, uh, ideal structure. But just in terms of getting, you know, getting product out the, out the door, I think I'll, I'll throw this one. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Donna. 
Yeah, low inventory. If you're an inventory business, your inventory days will make or break your business. Um, it will either put pressure on your cash flow or you're going to sit with um, absolute redundant stock that you're, you're struggling to, to sell. Um, so a typical benchmark for inventory days is, let's say, 30 inventory days is a typically good in indication that you're man maintaining and managing your inventory very well. Um, and uh, if anything like 90 inventory days might be that, shucks, you might not necessarily be, um, your inventory, you have inventory for like three months before you actually turn it into sales. So that's, those are typically some of the considerations. So you, you really want to uh, reduce your inventory days. It has a massive impact on your working capital, especially if you're working with a lot of, 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 of inventory. So my, my considerations here is obviously I understand the founder's risk or the business owner risk. You don't want to be in a scenario where you have negative stock quantities and you might uh, lose a key client. So I understand that as well. But you also don't want to be in a position where you have a lot of stock and it, it costs um, a lot of money to store that inventory. You know, you know, you run the risk of having slow moving inventory or the markets change and then you have um, um, inventory that doesn't sell well. So really, if you want to reduce your inventory days, you will have to invest in your inventory management system. So for instance, um, we have a client that we've implemented unleased for um, and that integrates with zero. Before that, they had a periodic um, stock system, which basically meant they didn't track each stock item as it was um, um, bought and sold. They basically just do um, quarterly stock counts. And you know what, which resulted in quarterly stock write-offs that didn't have uh, a, 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 a you know, an idea how the inventory was moving, you know, by implementing a, a perpetual stock system, fancy word, but basically what it means is tracking each uh, stock item from um, initial uh, purchase order to actual delivery to, to when you actually sell that item, you, they, they had a better grasp on that individual item's gross profit margin. And that really helped the guys to to understand which is the money makers, the slow movers, you know, uh, really um, helping their decisions on how they should they should forecast and do their purchase orders. So by understanding the trends and the consumer buy a, a market and other consumers spent, you know which products to, to focus on and which purchase orders to increase and to reduce. You don't want to have purchase orders for stock items that's just going to sit in your warehouse and not going to sell it because that will just ramp up your inventory days. So I think it's essential to, in order to reduce reduce your inventory days low, you need to have the right system in place, very accurate inventory forecasting, a very good understanding of what the demand in the market is. And now with COVID-19, it's very challenging because uh, there's so much uncertainty. So you really need to be creative. And I've seen some creative business models from, from the likes of moving to consignment stock where it's not really your stock and the risk of the stock is on someone else to even, for instance, drop shipping where people buy from you um, you know, but someone else owns the, shop, um, the stock and you just put your label on it and they'll do the delivery for it, you know, and your inventory days is basically zero. Um, some very creative ways and so, but it really challenges us to, to, to thinking of how to reduce inventory, inventory days. But in short, a great system. If you can measure it, you can improve it and track it and uh, you know, to really just un understanding your inventory um, and, uh, on a new level. Sure. My, my mental notepad is going to catch fire. I'm sure some of the uh, webinar participants are also making notes on, on this one. Thank you, Donna. That's really good. Um, our, our last uh, last lever would then be, you know, negotiating with suppliers on payment terms. Like how can we increase the creditors days, the amount of time between when we receive a product or service uh, and when we actually have to pay for it. Uh, Lazan, I believe this one is, is, is for you. Like how can we think about you know, maybe if we're used to paying our guys on 30 day terms, how can we get it to 60 days or even 45 days or something more? Yeah, no, I guess the good news is that this is the perfect time to negotiate. Yeah. Um, I think the bad news is that it goes both ways. So your customers may require <laughs> um, negotiated terms with you as well. Um, for me, relationships are key, um, I guess, hopefully by now you already have a good relationship with your suppliers. Um, and I think it's important to, when you have those negotiations, to be honest, um, to be reasonable, um, come to some kind of agreement that is hopefully beneficial for both parties. Um, make sure that you speak to the right person um, who is actually the decision maker. 
and come up with you know a few plans um, and a few suggestions um, to maybe not go from 30 to 60 days and then maybe a plan B to 45 days etc but yeah for me the most important is to to be honest and open and, and reasonable in the negotiations okay thank you thank you no, that's that's perfect guys so Sure, I think we've covered a lot of places. I think there's about 100 bullet points uh, noted down here, most likely in terms of how can we increase profitability and maximize cash in the process of running our company. It's, uh, you know, it's very valuable to use the, the seven lever uh, uh, tool approach to, you know, to running the company under crisis conditions like we've got at the moment. It's also very useful to do it under normal circumstances. So regardless of where your company finds itself right now, I think, you know, there's something to be to be made in terms of better bottom line uh, profitability and better cash flow using something like this like this approach uh, the, the next line of you know the next line of questioning uh, there's a couple of key elements that i think business owners need to be aware of in, in, in terms of you know in terms of, of scaling up their companies and making sure that you know they understand the key metrics that drive cash flow and, and profitability uh, and a lot of that's kind of it, it, it's it's it originates from asking the right questions to your finance team, like whether you've got an external accountant or in-house CFO and accountant or finance team or whatever that case is, the business owner ultimately needs to take the responsibility in terms of driving that, those core questions in the company of like, you know, how, how are we doing right now and how can we do better in, in future? And one of those things for me really is meeting rhythms to make sure that the finance team, whether you're a small business with one kind of outsourced part-time accountant or a massive company with a 20 man finance team, you need to make sure that there's good rhythms in terms of running the company finance and numbers. So I'd be curious guys, if I were to put this to the, the panel, like what are the, some of the ideal meeting rhythms that we'd like a financial team to have? If we were to start in kind of like just a small company, like a handful of staff, one finance person, a simple-ish business, um, ways, what would you say does a team like that need to report on? I would say for a small business, I'd recommend a minimum every month at least to review your management accounts, especially if you bill clients every month. So it would cover one cycle of invoicing. Then you can at least review that cycle. Also, if you, for example, sometimes it happens where you might miss a supplier invoice or if you must, you, you pick it up very quickly on a, on a one monthly review of your management accounts. But if you only review it after three months, if you missed a supplier invoice for the last three months, that's yeah. a relationship that, that might be destroyed in that time. So uh, one month you can sort of get away with and you can pick it up and resolve it. Three months is a bit dangerous. So one month from a rhythm point of view, I think is, is, is best at the minimum. Donna, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I like what Wise has mentioned. If you're a smaller team as a founder, you might be the person uh, doing the work doing the invoicing, doing the recovery, as well as you have to put your director hat on and looking at the financials um, um, from a from stakeholder point of view. Um, something to be on the lookout for is just um, uh, creeping debtors, long outstanding de uh, debtors, you know, um, and sometimes that might be an outlier where you will have to, on a weekly basis, uh, look into your debtors and long outstanding debt to follow up on that. Um, that that one, if, if, you, if too much time goes by then uh, you could um, run into to some challenges um, yeah and uh, from rhythms low what I, what I just want to say from a um, you know from a from a smaller type of, of size of team it's important to split operational from strategic rhythm sessions um, so from operational point of view um, do, don't discuss strategic stuff if that right. makes sense um, focus on the operational running um, of the business and then uh, you know from a strategic point of view even from a monthly to a quarterly basis to to put some dedicated time aside for, for um, looking at what your goals um, for the next quarter and um, you know really pushing yourself to achieving those um, just some thoughts on that low thanks Donna Lizanne you've then worked in the reporting uh, departments of much bigger companies like if, you know if we're talking 20 or 50 or 100 or even a couple of 100 people in a, in a, in a business and a big finance, uh, finance team. Like if you're a business owner in that scenario, like what are the additional things that you would want to ask uh, in terms of meeting rhythms and, and reporting? Yeah, no, I think traditionally uh, meeting rhythms were probably monthly or even quarterly, um, depending on um, how many levels of management you have in the hierarchy. Um, I think we don't have that luxury anymore 
because of the time that we're in, we really have to move fast and business owners are required to make quick decisions. Yeah. And in order to make those decisions, they need um, information um, on a very regular basis. So I would even go as far to say to push some of those finance meetings, even in bigger organizations to weekly. Um, definitely um, reviewing your cash flow on a weekly basis, definitely keeping an eye on outstanding debtors um, and on revenue targets, etc. cetera. Um, overall management accounts, you can probably still do on a, um, on a monthly basis, but those things definitely weekly. Luckily, um, on the one side where we don't have the luxury of waiting for two weeks um, to, to present management accounts, we have the luxury of amazing packages like Xero and Spotlight and other cloud accounting packages where we can literally have those things ready within a few hours because everything's automated um, and everything's um, for in feed through, for instance, live bank feeds, etc. Thanks for that, Zon. Guys, the, the next one I want to want to cover is uh, is around pitfalls and common mistakes that often that often get made. Um, you know, there's a lot of different mistakes that you know, whether it's one industry or the other. Sometimes you know we, we see many many companies come through the door, and often the mis there's similarity in the mistakes the guys make, and many of those state mistakes translate to issues in terms of profitability and and, and cash flow. I see you, who yeah, does a lot of gap analysis work. He's uh, definitely not nodding yes on that one. Okay, so I'd just like to hear from the from the, the the panel. Just what are some of the key pitfalls and mistakes that companies often make that cost them in terms of profitability and cash waste? Do you want to go first? Uh, definitely. I think the the main ones are things like missing out on the tax deadlines, the CIPC deadlines, and the workman's compensation deadlines. In theory, you should be paying employees tax every month and VAT at least every two months, and provisional tax every six months. And you have, should be submitting your financial statements at least once a year. Uh, also, you, if you don't, uh, some, sometimes, uh, especially when it comes to CIPC, if you're not submitting your annual return on an annual basis, it's such a small amount and it's such a small uh, submission, but your company could de get deregistered. And, and if your company is deregistered, you can't get finance, you, you can't scale, it's impossible. So that's a small thing that you, that you just need to solve on, a, on an annual basis. And then... Uh, Something that, that, that a lot of companies also miss out is the workman's compensation that they're supposed to pay on an annual basis to the Department of Labor. Because we're not paying it directly to SARS, that's one of the things that sometimes falls through the cracks. Um, and also, for example, having an annual AGM and a director's meeting, for example, just to pr uh, prove your financial statements. If you're a scaling company and you want to bring an investor on board, they're going to look for certain things uh, that show that, 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 that they can take you seriously, that you're not a mom and pop shop, that you are a company that can be invested in. So I think that's one of my, 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 main, my main inputs. Appreciate it. Basics on, on, ta on tax and compliance sounds like it. Don't, don't pay SARS more than you need to. Lizanne, what are some of the basic mistakes you often see? I think Alo, on the corporate governance side, um, what happens many times in SMEs is that the people who are um, responsible for the governance is many times the one and the same person. Um, because the shareholders, the directors and management may actually be the same individual or the same few individuals. Um, on the one hand, that makes things easy and it means that decisions can be made very quickly. On the other hand, the pitfalls are that um, you don't necessarily have a soundboard that you can speak to um, about those decisions. Um, I think where it becomes a little bit more complex is also where you have external funders and external shareholders. Um, then there's definitely need for a more formal um, type of government governance to be to be in place. Um, I think for me, the basic things that are required um, are probably a decision approval framework so that it's clear, you know, who's who's responsible for what decisions to be made. Um, having regular board meetings um, and also keep minutes of those board meetings, because many times, especially in small um, in small companies, a board may, meeting may be very informal um, and there may, may be no notes um, or minutes of it afterwards. Um, and definitely during this time um, to have some kind of risk management matrix in place um, that can assist you to identify risks um, and also how to, how to act on those. 
I mean, I, I would expect if, if you do have a risk matrix, a world pandemic would now be on every single of those matrix matrices. Um, yes. And it may not have featured at all four months ago. Yep. Um, yeah, so I think for me, those are the main things. Thanks, Azan. Okay. That, that approval process sticks with me because I know two, two entrepreneurs who've lost a million rand in the last, in the last year because someone has prompted uh, someone in their accounts team to pay a million rand over to a Nigerian account. <laughs> Which, which was done without, uh, you know, without the, the proper process being followed and money being transferred out and evaporating. And, you know, that's cash flow and profitability down the toilet uh, for, a, yeah, for quite a bit. Sorry, Donna, go for it. Yeah, I just want to add to that. Remember, people are irrational, especially during this time. So your founders or your co-founders or the other shareholders and directors, their personal circumstances might change over the next six months. So it's very important that you have got a sufficient corporate government structures in place that lay out the ground rules of, um, you know, how dividends work, what's a dividend policy. So you don't want a, sh a shareholder forcing down a dividend because he's on the board or, you know, and then... Uh, <laughs> resigning and, and you know and you, you really struggle to get to grow further because of that so um really those those ground rules is very important from a corporate government's point of view as, as now um, during now as well thanks guys um so for all our attendees um just if there are any questions i see there's one already in the q a you're welcome to pop it into chat or into 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 the q a and to give you guys a minute or two to do that, I just want to ask for a kind of a, a, a closing remark from each one of the, the panelists. If you guys were to make, you know, make, make one last recommendation to business owners who are looking to build a scalable, profitable company at the end of the day, whether it's financial or non-financial, kind of like what would your golden nugget uh, be? Always I'll pass the ball to you first. I, I guess if, if you're trying to scale your business, now is not the time to be penny shy and pound foolish. Yes, I can understand if, if you're cost cutting and you're trying to make the business survive, then you need to cut costs. But if you're trying to scale, now is now is the time to invest in your business. Now is not the time, as, as Dana was talking earlier about dividends, now is not the time to, to uh, take out all your profits as dividends. You need to reinvest some of that, that money back into your business so that your business can grow and so that it can become an engine. Uh, that's probably the most important. And then starting to plan, setting up things like cash flow forecasts, having trusted advisors with you that you can lean on. Uh, I think those, those are must do's from my, from my side. Love it. Thank you. Uh, Lison? Yeah, I think for me, um, one of the things to remember is that um, when, when people start a business, they usually do it to focus on their own passion. Um, they don't necessarily to do admin um, and to, to learn about what other people may see as the boring stuff um, about accounting and finances. Um, that's why people like us are there um, because that's our passion. Um, but I think it's, it is important for founders to learn the basics. Um, I've seen that where um, founders have really spent some time to at least learn the basics, to know what we're talking about, they definitely reap the fruits of that in the long run. Sure. Um, yeah. Donna, closing remark from your side, one or two golden nuggets. My main one for founders is the principle of tight, loose, tight under people management. Founders need to manage their, their team. So first you need to be tight with the expectations of your team. Then you need to be loose. You need to allow them within their way of doing it to operate, achieving those outcomes. And then you need to be tight again. You need to follow up, keep them accountable for what the outcomes you have put initially out there. Um, yeah, tight, loose, tight. Love it. Thank you very much for that. Uh, love it. People management coming coming through. Uh, and I believe a World Economic Forum uh, quotation coming through there. Yes. Yeah, well. very, very good. <laughs> um, look, I'm looking at uh, the Q&A here. So the first question we have is, what is a good inventory system to propose? Donna, can I pass this to you? Yeah, it all depends on the, the size of your business. And if you're already on the cloud, um, we love to work with um, unleashed inventory. It integrates seamlessly with zero. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's an amazing system. It also plugs in with e-commerce um, and has a lot of API integrations with other software. It really has an amazing dashboard of understanding what your slow moving um, invoices are, um, are etc. So that's an amazing one. 
um, yeah, that's the one that we also would typically recommend. Unleashed nice. inventory. Thanks. Thanks for that. And the other question um, was about bank charges. Like, how can one manage bank charges? Waves, do you want to take this one? If, if I can jump in here, the, the, I suppose there's many ways. One of the, the options is, is just to say, have a specific payment days so that you don't make ad hoc payments every single time and, and smaller or smaller payments because each payment you make might have charges that, that get added to them. Also, you still get, you still get some clients who, who make cash deposits and those bank charges are massive. So making sure there's EFTs for things like that are very important and, and also managing your cash flow to make sure you, if you don't, sometimes every time you go into an overdraft, you get penalized by the bank. So making sure that you're always remaining in a positive, it's a small thing, but making sure you're always remaining in that positive balance will keep you from spending too much money on, on bank charges. Definitely. Thank you, guys. So I think that those are the only two, two questions. That's actually we're, we're very close to the, oh, hang on, there's an, another one. Uh, what percentage of business owners are investing through the cycle in the business? Um, and what are your recommendations? Valuations of peers have been compressed and cheaper financing allows for horizontal and vertical acquisitions. Wow, this is a <laughs> properly typed up uh, question. Examples of larger JC conglomerates like Brian Joffrey have invested through the cycle. Does anyone on the panel have an idea in terms of, you know, is now the time uh, to, uh, to make investments in your own industry or is now the time to run uh, from those investments because times are tough. Well, low, I'll, I'll give it a first, a first shot. You know, um, if you are in a, a very fortunate position uh, where you have capital to invest, um, and uh, the, the best industries to typically invest is is the industries that you understand yourself. So, uh, if that means a, a vertical expansion and there's opportunities, and if you understand uh, and you um, the industry and you already have a lot of the market share already, then that could, could be an, uh, a very or, uh, organic investment for you, um, if that makes sense. Brilliant. If, if I can maybe add something here as well. Um, I would also say, have a look at, is, are we taking short, uh, have a long-term view. Are you taking short-term pain or is this how the market has changed completely for your sector? If, it, if it's a long-term issue, then yes, we need to think about whether we should be investing. If it's just a short term for the, because of lockdown and because of these few months, then we, we can trade through the cycle and, and, and invest in the business in that period. Solid. As I said, there's another question or two coming through, but I'm afraid that's, uh, that's all the, that we have uh, time for for today. Uh, so a big thank you to our panelists. Uh, appreciate all your time and insights sh uh, shared here today. And thank you for all the, the business owners and professionals who've, who've joined us today. We hope you've received some value. I know I have a whole uh, list full of, uh, full of bullet points in terms of things to think about and look at implementing uh, across different companies. Uh, so yeah, I'm very excited about that. We will make this, uh, this video available afterwards on uh, some of the social media channels and our, um, our YouTube channel. So you can have a, keep an eye out. I think all the participants will probably also get an email uh, with the, the link to the, to the video as soon as the editing's done and it's up. Um, and then, yeah, we, we, look, we look forward to connecting with, with all of you in, the, in the, the course of the next couple of weeks and wishing you all the best uh, in terms of building your scalable, profitable company at the end of the day in a, in a time such as this, uh, which is, yeah, I think having that, having that skill set behind you is probably one of, going to be one of the skill sets of the future to have. Uh, so very excited for your journey and great to spend time with all you guys. We'll speak soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.